So I'm Tom Mitchell. I'm from uh, Argonne National Laboratory just outside Chicago. I've been there for uh, a little over 20, almost 26 years, actually 26 years. Um, working in the area of new materials discovery and uh, sort of at the border between materials chemistry and materials physics. I'm trained as a chemist actually, uh, but the chemist would disavow me and, well, the physicists sort of tolerate me. So uh, it's a good place to be, sort of in between. And um, so I'm going to talk to you about a hammer today. So David was talking about, uh, you know, problem-driven uh, science. This is really somewhat technique-driven, right? So we're talking about a particular approach to growing crystals using this floating zone technique, and in particular using high pressure as a, as a means to move phase boundaries and discover new materials and grow things that you couldn't grow otherwise. And, and so even though it is a bit of a technique-driven talk, I'm going to hopefully motivate why we use it with some real problems that uh, you know, are relevant to condensed matter physics. And, and ultimately, that's what we want to try to get at, right? I mean, growing these crystals, whether it's by vapor or floating zone or flux, whatever, is really to try to understand new states of matter. So I'm going to try to talk about how we can use these high pressure techniques to find some of these new states of matter. So if, uh, I don't want to uh, screw up here and get to the end of the time and not to uh, uh, acknowledge the people who really were responsible for, uh, for pushing this envelope, uh, and in particular this uh, fellow here, Junji Zhang, who's now at Oak Ridge, as a matter of fact, uh, who's really now I consider one of the pioneers of high pressure floating zone growth that really got us going about five years ago when we started into this, into this journey. And, uh, and hopefully by the end you'll see the fruits of some of that labor and, and see the justification for why you do all this stuff. Okay, so uh, typically I've given this talk a couple other times at this workshop and there's usually been somebody like Sang Chong who's talked about floating zone techniques in general ahead of me. So there's nobody there who's done that if you've had some practical experience. So I just want to say just a couple things in sort of in general about the, this technique and why it's, it's relevant and then we'll focus on this particular branch or or a, a segment of, high, of floating zone using these high pressure approaches. So, so here's a, a, one of the luminaries of our field. Uh, Bob Kava has been invoked several times here just in the last hour. And about 10 years ago, uh, he wrote uh, in this uh, paper, uh, in this uh, report called Frontiers in Crystal and Matter that floating zone techniques are arguably the best thing to have happened uh, to happen to single crystal growth in the past, well, at that time it was 25 years. It's still true, 35 years. So. Um, so why, that's a pretty bold statement, so why, why does he say something like that? And um, all you have to do is look at some of the sort of seminal work, the, the, the important things that have come out of uh, condensed matter physics. And uh, uh, so here's an example of uh, exploring uh, these uh, uh, superconductor, current phase of superconductors, and being able to uh, use uh, neutrons to explore the uh, spin waves of these and extract out the underlying exchange constants that are associated with these square nets and then use these to understand how superconductivity can grow out of these. So they uh, had to have a crystal to do that. Uh, here's some work out of my own uh, group from a, not quite a decade ago, uh, looking at short range order in these frustrated magnets. This is a, a different kind of frustrated magnet we created. And we used uh, these crystals to do diffuse uh, magnetic neutro, uh, diffuse neutron scattering and extract from this these patterns uh, again, sort of these underlying exchange constants that give rise to uh, some uh, sort of unusual uh, magnetic behavior uh, uh, engendered by these triangles and cagamate layers that build together to make this, this material. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, here's a work out of uh, Japan uh, from Nakatsuji, again with uh, one of these float zone grown crystals, uh, looking at uh, using neutrons. Uh, to explore interesting excitations associated with these Dirac strings and magnetic monopoles um, sort of embedded in a, uh, in a spin ice type material pyrophore. Okay, so those are just sort of three splashy kind of pictures. They all kind of look the same. You've got an interesting crystal structure. You have some kind of neutron pattern. You have a big crystal. And, and really that's kind of the message of why this floating zone technique has been so impactful uh, in the area of condensed matter, and in particular in, in complex oxide, transition metal oxide physics, uh, because of this insatiable neutron scatterer. Right? So these neutron scatterers, I don't know if there's any neutron scatterers in the room here, but uh, they're never satisfied because the neutron has a rather poor cross-section, unlike x-rays, and so you need a lot of, of mass 
to be able to get a big signal. Now it's gotten better with a place like the SNS, but still, uh, they like to have these big crystals. And, and so you don't grow a big crystal like this typically by vapor transport, or you don't grow it by fluxes. You get small crystals that way. Uh, so, but the zone refining technique, uh, which was actually developed in the 50s by laboratories as a way of purifying silicon, uh, has been adapted by the materials physics community to grow crystals of, uh, of complex materials and use them for uh, ex uh, measuring excitations and other properties uh, using neutrons and x-rays. Um, so just a, a little sort of uh, exposition here about the uh, um, types of, of, of floating zone of furnaces that are out there. Uh, so these are so-called optical zone furnaces, and they work by, uh, in some way or other, focusing the image of a lamp, like a halogen lamp or a xenon lamp or a high power um, source uh, uh, using mirrors. Uh, into, a, into a small region that's you know, a few millimeters by a few millimeters. So you get a hot zone and you melt. It's kind of like you know, using a magnifying glass with the sun, that kind of thing. That's the principle. Um, and, and there's different ways of doing this. Um, so you can do it with two mirrors. You can do it with four mirrors. You can do it in a vertical configuration with two mirrors. These are all horizontal. Or more recently, uh, there's been this approach instead of using a bulb and mirrors at all, just direct heating using lasers. And uh, I, I know there's a furnace such as this at, uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. And, uh, and Song has one at Rutgers, and they're kind of growing. Everybody loves them. I don't have one. And I'll be envious. Um, but nonetheless, all these, these approaches are just different geometries for accomplishing the same, um, the same end. Right? So you get some sort of hot zone here in a very narrow region that you can then pass a polycrystalline ingot through and grow a crystal. And so uh, uh, the advantages that uh, uh, David pointed out a minute ago to this is uh, that it's containerless because the, the, the uh, crystal and the feed rod are sort of suspended in, in, in air you know, or in some sort of atmosphere and enclosed in, a, in an envelope, silica, usually a silicon en silica en envelope. Uh, so you can adjust the composition of that atmosphere or as you'll see, you go on the pressure. So it's containerless. You don't have contamination from a crucible uh, or a transport agent. Uh, you, we'll say we'll control the atmosphere. That's the main theme of this talk. Um, and you can grow crystals that are either congruently melting or incongruently melting. Right? So if you think about uh, crystal growth, did you guys do any Tchaikovsky or anything here at this, at this lab or Richmond? Um, Talk about anybody? No, but we had a tutorial on phase diagrams. OK. Anyway, so you guys know, so you know the difference between a congruent and incongruent <coughs> melting compound. So you can do either with these uh, because the zone actually, as it's growing, adjusts its composition to the paratactic necessary. Okay, so this is just a, a high-level view of, uh, of this. Um, again, so here's the, the heart of the matter. So the, what's happened to the image, you can see here in the background here, the image of the, of the filaments. You, these guys have probably already seen this in the real lab. Here's the molten zone. Here's the feed material. Here's kind of a pre-melt zone, which you try to avoid if you can, and then, and then the growing crystal. Um, here's the here's a just uh, image furnace that we have at our at our lab. It's a high pressure zone furnace. David and uh, the guys at Oak Ridge have one as well. They were theirs was delivered about the same time as ours five years ago. Um, it's a vertical geometry. We'll talk a little bit later in the talk about why this vertical geometry is advantageous in certain cases. Um, uh, it's you can see it's pretty tall here. Here's uh, here's Jujius sitting in the operating the furnace. But it, it's, it's sort of like uh, four meters tall, something like that. Uh, and uh, the lamp is at the bottom. It sits down here. And, uh, and then the, the crystal grows up here at the top. Uh, OK, so the proof of the pudding is in the eating, right? So is anything coming out of these furnaces? So here, I've uh, gone through the literature and, and pulled out as of, uh, well, six months ago, something, a list of all the sort of discoveries and papers that have been written using these high pressure zone furnaces. And uh, so you can see a lot of this here started sort of five or six years ago uh, out of Germany where the people actually developed this furnace based on a Russian uh, prototype. Um, and, then, and then since then a few others have appeared. So we've grown, uh, published a few and so there's others. Somewhere on here is one from Oak Ridge. I should have labeled it. Uh, but you can see here that uh, things are beginning to roll out 
but there's only a few of these installed uh, in the world, as you can see on this map. Um, three of them in the United States, Oak Ridge, uh, Argonne, and, and just down the road at Johns Hopkins. And they, they actually have one that goes to 300 bar. Mine and, and David's, well, it's not David, but Brian Sales's, uh, goes to 150, so you have pressure envy. Uh, but if you just kind of look, there's quite a few coming over here in, 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 uh, uh, in, in Asia, center of gravity, however, if, if you look at the publication list here, the center of gravity of research on uh, high pressure zone is somewhere here in the middle of the Atlantic, right? So somewhere between Dresden and the United States. That's the center of gravity. Uh, okay, so why do, what's the advantage here? So um, what I hope to ex uh, explore with you today and demonstrate um, is that you can use this high pressure uh, for discovering new materials, um, access crystals of known materials that you couldn't grow otherwise, and I'll explain why based on phase diagram analysis this is sensible, and, and another thing you can do is you can extend doping regions. So David pointed out that you can make a new material if you can if you can take a known material and dope, say, calcium for lanthanum, for manganite. Well, sometimes under ambient conditions that you would grow in your normal lab, you run into walls that you can only dope so far. And it turns out this high pressure can actually allow you to access higher oxidation states of the transition metal and so make this deeper doping possible. I'll give an example of that to very Okay, so this is the kind of the outline, the, after the, the that introduction to floating zone furnace uh, work. Uh, motivate why to use high pressure, besides those three bullets, um, and sort of give you a, a physics reason why, or chemistry reason why. Uh, and then give you a little bit more of a tour of this high pressure furnace so you can see the parts. You'll be able to compare that to what you've seen in the, in the lab here on a, on a regular uh, optical furnace. Uh, and then I'll give uh, a few case studies that illustrate these, these points and why, why we're, we're putting the effort into this. Okay, so uh, you know, like if we want to make new phases, we want to discover a new phase, in the end you've got to move a phase boundary. Right? So you're, you're happily sitting here studying phase A, but someplace across a phase boundary lies phase B and that's where you want to get. Um, and so you can use um, different variables, different parameters to move across those phase boundaries, right? You could have simple things like you use change temperature, right? Um, you can use pressure um, to change melting points. You can use it to suppress phase transitions. You can extend stability ranges um, or extend a, or expand a solubility limit. Or you can do something really cool and convert something that melts incongruently, which is kind of a pain in the neck to grow a lot of the times, into something that's congruently melting. I'll give an example of that. So, Ultimately, you want to use some physical parameter, in this case, pressure, and really what I'm going to argue, give you the sneak preview here, is it's not pressure, but it's really fugacity um, to achieve all of these kinds of transformations in, in discovery. Okay, so here's a freshman chemistry, I guess. Um, right, so here's the free energy of some kind of phase transformation. Uh, uh, measures uh, you know, whether phase A or phase B is, is, the, smaller, or is the more stable. Um, it involves a few terms here. The simplest one we think about is there's, there's an enthalpic term. This is delta H. This is the endothermic versus exothermic business. There's an entropy term, which of course at high temperature, entropy starts to win. This is the reason why David pointed out correctly that these high temperature growths, you get more defects and intergrowths and problems because the entropy starts to uh, raise its ugly head. Uh, and then there's this other term, right, that, uh, this, this work term, this P delta V term, right? So this is just purely a mechanical energy associated with uh, pressure and, and change in volume of the bulk modulus of the material. And so, uh, in principle, you could look at this and say, well, all right, well, if I can use, I can apply pressure, I can change the free energy between two phases, and then I can, uh, I can, I can achieve what I want. I can discover new materials. So this should be a, a way of doing phase control. All right, so let's look at that. Uh, so here's more, here's more freshmen. This is probably a T-time or something, right? Or, uh, right, so piston, cylinder, you know, frictionless piston, we all, we all have those in our shop. Um, and you know, as you, as you press, on, press on a gas, you do work on that gas, right? So you press a piston down and it compresses the gas. And so you can do work 
just according to this formula, right? Sort of the pressure times the cross-sectional area of the piston times the distance that you move it, right? And that gives you a, 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 an energy which is in this funny units of liter atmospheres. But you can look at a table and you find that's, out of, that's about a tenth of a kilojoule, um, which is a, kind of a chemical number. Uh, <clears throat> and so you can, you can plug some things in. If you put an ideal gas into your cylinder, mole of it, and, uh, and you just squeeze it uh, isothermally, um, uh, you get about 220 20 kilojoules out of that. All right, well, there's a number. What does 220 kilojoules mean? So, um, so I put a couple things here to give you, to put you on scale. So if you wanted to form water from the elements, oxygen and hydrogen, um, it costs you 286 kilojoules per mole, or you get 286 kilojoules per mole. So there you can see these are kind of similar kinds of numbers. So there's a lot of energy that you can do by, you get by pressing a, a, a cylinder in a piston, right? That's why the steam engine can move. Um, here's another thing, like if you melt water, right, it's six kilojoules per mole, so quite a bit smaller because you're not really making and breaking bonds. You're just sort of taking something and, and crystallizing it, making make hydrogen bonds. Um, so this is a gas, right? So gas is it's compressible. So what about things that are incompressible, like liquids and solids, right? So that's what we really want to do. We want to make materials out of solids, or maybe we've got to melt, and we want to think about how pressure affects these things. All right, so I went into the literature to find something, and uh, here's, a, here's this zinc chromium spinel. And I'd like to say that I picked it out because it's a neat material, because it's a, you know, it's a frustrated spin system, there's some neat magnetic clusters. It's not true. It's one, it was the first thing that I found that I could find the bulk modulus data on it. So that's, what, that's why I picked it. Um, and so here I'm plotting the unit cell volume as a function of pressure. It's basically linear. And, and then, then the slope of that line essentially is a measure of the compressibility of the, of the, uh, of the sample. Now, um, you see here that I put a, a unit here, this pressure is, is in, in, in gigapascal. So who knows what a gigapascal is? Nobody knows what a gigapascal is. So I'm telling you, it's about 10 kilobar. It's, it's 10 kilobar, um, at, or 10,000 atmospheres. That's, that's kind of, it's pretty close to 10 kilobar. Uh, it's 10,000 atmospheres. So a gigapascal, that's a, lot of, that's a lot of pressure. So what you can see here is the volume is changing. Um, by a few, you know, by a few percent, not even 10 percent, over 10 gigapascal. So we're now up to 100,000 atmospheres, and we've only changed the volume by a little tiny bit. That's why we call it incompressible. So, uh, how much work can we do in this kind of in this kind of situation? All right. Oh, so I want to tell you something about pressure. So here's a picture of the curve, right? So here's this uh, again gigapascal on the bottom. Look at this 400 gigapascal at the inner core. So this thing here, where we're squeezing the zinc chromium spinel, uh, we're kind of at the upper mantle. Right? We're like nowhere near there. And 150 bar, uh, like like that, or three, even 300 bar down at, at Johns Hopkins, uh, is kind of just barely off the axis. Right? So we're not looking at the depth of the Earth here for these experiments. You can do those kinds of experiments if you have the right techniques. But with the gas pressure that we're generating in these furnaces, we're not looking at the core. OK, so let's go on here. Um, so, so here's, uh, this is uh, uh, volume versus pressure. Like this is about a 5% change in volume over 10 GPA. Um, so you can integrate this up to calculate the total work done. And here I'm, I'm plotting it, and it's like parabolic, right? The lines can be parabola. And I've gone back to atmospheres along this line so because it makes it look bigger, right? And so here is the, the, the total work that you can do on zinc chromium uh, oxide as you squeeze it. And it ain't much. Right? So here's this heat diffusion of water plotted on here again. And you've got to get to 20,000 atmospheres to get that equivalent energy. It doesn't mean that you can melt ice by squeezing water, right? Or, or you don't make ice by squeezing water. That's, that doesn't make any sense if you know the phase diagram. But just to put your energy equivalent. So uh, here's 150 bar, right? We're barely off the axis. 300 bar is basically barely off the axis. Um, so we're not doing much. If you want to do high pressure synthesis using pressure as the as the real trend, as the real driving force for doing something, you've got to go to big pressures. You've got to use cubic presses or octahedral presses or diamond anvils to grow things, right? So we know that you can make diamond by squeezing on graphite, but you've got to go to sort of five GPA and several hundred degrees or a thousand degrees Celsius to do it. And then if you go up to these massive pressures here, you could do sort of looking at, now you can look at geology or you can look at things that are going on in Jupiter 
and this is where you can make superconductors out of hydrogen and sulfide or lanthanum and hydrogen if you've been reading the uh, archive lately. So we're not doing this. So the, mes the messages to, uh, are twofold. If you've got enough uh, pressure, you can move phase lines. Um, but with the kind of stuff I'm talking about, we're doing nothing in PV work. So we're not moving phase lines based on mechanical work as a contribution to, to the free energy. So what are we doing? Okay. So this is where chemistry comes in, and we'll just kind of forget that PDV term and, and go back to the, um, the free energy Gibbs equation, right? So enthalpy minus temperature times change in entropy. Uh, and here I'm just giving you sort of a, 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 a generic reaction. We're looking at an oxide. We have some sort of compound, a metal oxide, and it dissociates to make a metal plus gas, right? So there's a chemical reaction. Uh, here's a table that shows lots of these, right? So this is called an Ellingham diagram, and it's complicated. Don't worry about it. But all these lines are essentially thermodynamic measures of this equation for different metals and oxides. And they, and they follow along and they lie and tell you when, under what conditions of oxygen pressure and temperature, you're going to get a, a compound or you're going to get the elements. So you can look at these and read them off and figure it out. Um, there's a, uh, uh, you know, an equilibrium constant for this. Uh, the, the case of P, which in, for a, for, as drawn like this, is just the oxygen pressure or really the fugacity, um, not the pressure, but we'll just, for the sake of argument, we'll call it the pressure. Um, and so uh, this just measures the, the, these lines. Um, and ultimately tells you something about the stability field of this. So uh, again, we, so David talked about the Chatelier's principle in terms of temperature with uh, uh, endo and exothermic reactions. Well, this is a, here's another example here. If you go to higher pressures of oxygen, you're going to shift the, uh, because this is a gas, you're going to shift the, the, enter, the uh, reaction to the, to the left and, and make the oxide, uh, make the compound that you want, rather than some low oxidation metal plus oxygen. Uh, here's a real life example of it. Um, here's copper oxide. Uh, plotted here is a function of oxygen pressure over many decades and temperature up to 1200 degrees. And here's some phase lines that separate <coughs> copper oxide CuO, which is copper 2. Cu2O, cuprous oxide, which is copper one, and copper metal. So we've, there's kind of two, two different equations here uh, plotted this, in this uh, diagram. Here you can see that as you uh, sit at a fixed pressure and increase the temperature, you go across this line like this, and so you're reducing the material. And if you go along this direction, and you go at a fixed temperature and increase the oxygen pressure, then you oxidize it. Right? So it's no, not particularly, um, it's not rocket science. Um, here's an example that you can use this exact same kind of analysis, though, not just in solids, but in, in, in liquids and melts. So these are some data from well, now, you know, 30 years ago looking at vanadium oxide in the melt, and they actually analyzed the, uh, the uh, concentration of, of vacancies in this material as a function of the, the uh, fugacity uh, in the, uh, above the melt. And, and you can see they, they form these lines, and the fact that this line has a, it's a given slope of minus one quarter is relevant because it says that there's a law of mass action that's associated with this process of sort of dissociating or, or removing oxygen from BO2 and you can actually write an equilibrium constant. So you can actually see that there's thermodynamics um, going on here. Uh, so what's the impact of this on if you want to grow a crystal? So uh, if you want to grow a crystal, here's copper oxide and you heat this stuff up. Uh, you wanted to melt, you like to melt it, well you want to go through copper oxide, you want to go cuprous oxide, but the problem is you, you get killed because as you grow into this liquid phase, uh, you reduce the material. So if you want to suppress that, you've got to find a way to get a higher oxygen potential in the, in the environment, one way or another. Or you've got to go to lower temperature um, and use a flux. Okay, uh, last bit of uh, sort of introductory material is uh, something about, more about thermodynamics of, of gases, right? So probably you all studied the, maybe, probably probably carbon dioxide. That's when they always show the peak, I like it, right? It's a um, sort of critical behavior of gas. And, and so, so here's a phase diagram, which is a generic phase diagram, showing the sort of vapor, liquid, and, and, and solid, and, and, try, and the try critical point, and then the so-called uh, critical point out here. So the critical point is a, is a point by, beyond which um, you, you lose the distinction between a gas and a liquid, right? And so 
you're sitting out here. And in the case for oxygen, uh, the, the critical pressure is 50 bar. It's only 50 bar. So it's higher than 50 bar. Uh, it doesn't matter what the temperature is. You no longer have uh, uh, a gas. You have this critical fluid around you. So all the experiments we're talking about doing are well above this uh, if we're pushing the limit of the, of the, uh, of the furnace. And so uh, what I'm going to show you in some examples here is we're actually growing crystals not from a gas but from supercritical fluid. And to be honest, we really don't know what that implications of that are. And I think it's really an open area of study. Um, Tara McQueen, who I guess was here earlier in the week, may have said something about this. Um, he's actually, I'm going to show some pictures from his, his lab here. Um, so this is from my lab, this is from his lab, it's the same material, it's just sapphire. Um, and we're growing here at 5 bar, and this is just happily going along with problems. Here at 300 bar, uh, you can see a lot of turbulence, and you're sort of seeing the sort of you know, refraction of light in there due to the, uh, the, the presence of this, uh, of this fluid. And, uh, and so, the implicit, so this is what I've talked about already, about changing phase lines and the function of pressure and, and changing stability. Here's something, did he talk about this at all? I don't want to waste no, people's time. Okay, so, um, so somebody talked to, or it was you asked about pressure in, uh, um, in vapor transport. What if you like, put some back pressure, some inert gas or something? Well, that's gonna change the mean free path. It's your first approximation. And so you might be able to, in the case of a volatile compound in growing from, you know, in a, in a high temperature, well, you might imagine that if you put some background gas in there at some pressure, you might suppress that volatilization. And in fact, that's true. And what this curve shows is here that it uh, uh, can just sort of like use collision theory. You find that sure enough, you're going to suppress uh, vaporization rates uh, at initially. But then what happens is a crossover uh, to where now you have sort of a solution out here that sort of starts to dissolve stuff. Right, so there's some kind of, there could be a crossover here where there's a, maybe there's a sweet spot, but if you go too far, you actually can increase the rate of volatilization. So there's a lot of talk in the, you know, sort of hand waving that these high pressure zone furnaces can suppress volatilization. Well, be careful about that. Okay, so this is a recap of the first part of the talk here. Um, if we can move phase diagram lines that we can discover new materials, High pressure, in the case of floating zone furnace, doesn't mean pressure. It really means chemical pressure or chemical reactivity or fugacity. Um, and uh, if you go to higher PO2s, you can stabilize higher oxidation states. All right, so those are the, that's the test. Okay, so let's go and take a quick look at the, um, the furnace. There it is. Um, here again is the geometry in comparison to the two, two mirror horizontal. What do you guys have here? Four more mirror, four mirror, four mirror furnace. Um, uh, I've got a two mirror furnace I've used for 20 years. It still works beautifully. Um, and then this vertical geometry here uh, that uh, uh, has been adapted for, for the, um, the high pressure system. Uh, so we have a lamp down here. Uh, the lamp sits at the bottom, in the bottom focus mirror. Uh, it's a, you know, it can get you to 2,800 degrees if you use a pretty big lamp, at, even at 150 bar. And the reason you have to go to these high, high power lamps is because this, this fluid is, there's convection and there's heat transfer in this system. And so a lot, of, a lot of efficiency is lost due to this environment that you're growing in. So, you know, you have to have a lot of power to be able to get there. So you use a big bulb. Turns out it's a projector bulb, which is exactly what they use at you know, the movie theater. And it's an interesting historical uh, connection because one of the very early designs of a optical floating zone furnace in the 70s by Alexander Rev Kalevsky, he used a carbon arc projector bulb. He actually had a movie projector that he was using as the source. And so you kind of come full circle here uh, in the, you know, sort of 40 years later. Um, and, and, and so uh, the equivalent here, I'm saying, is like you, to, to melt this kind of thing in a four-mirror furnace, you sort of need, need, need 12 kilowatts um, at one bar. Um, and, 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 and these lasers are, are quite effect, efficient to be able to melt these things, but these are again all at low pressures. Uh, there's the growth chamber up at the top. Here's a close-up of it. Um, you can see the top mirror, and then just a bunch of stuff that allows you to move the, you know, the stage, uh, adjust the mirrors, and, uh, uh, and change rotations. Um, here's the, the space here. The chamber is not, the sample chamber is not in there, so you can see. This little guy that's sticking out here is actually an optical pyrometer. 
Um, you can't do pyrometry in the furnace you guys have because the system is flooded with IR. There's a way to do it in this. I won't, if anybody cares, I'll talk about it. Um, here's a cross section. I don't spend too much time on this. But here's the, here's the advantage of, the, of this vertical geometry. So if you have two bulbs, let's put it up here. If you have two bulbs, right, you have two point sources of light. And as you're rotating around here, there's sort of a you know, high dependence to the, the, the temperature uh, gradient, the sort of axial temperature gradient. Um, if you have a four lamp, well, now it's pi over two. But right here, this is sort of cylindrically symmetric and because of the design. And so you have a much more uniform, at least the, the ray tracing tells you, you have a much more uniform uh, radial gradient in temperature. And so that is, it, is, it, is, a, is a good thing for uh, a growing crystal. Okay. Um, you have to have a, something to contain it, right? So you can contain this pressure. So we have these uh, uh, silica, a uh, few silica um, tubes, right? They're kind of small. How big are the ones at the, the four? They're kind of long for your guys? Yeah, so these are long, these are small, so kind of like this, right? So maybe a third of the size or a quarter of the size of the ones you guys have seen in your practical. Uh, but to go to high pressures, quartz is not going to do the trick. And so the design is to use something that's more uh, sturdy, and so it's, a, it's this. It's a single crystal sapphire. So this is a big chunk of sapphire. Uh, here's a quarter to give you the scale. Um, but your, your opening is kind of like this, right? So your, your rod goes in through there. These are expensive. I think they're about $15,000, so we don't, we try not to drop them. <laughs> uh, we've never dropped one. We have a spare just in case. Um, you also want to put a, uh, you, if you worry about volatilization from your growth rate, your thing, that's a problem because if you deposit on the wall of the crystal and generate a hot spot, that would absorb the infrared from the lamps, and that might generate a very local strain and crack and break the, 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 the crystal. Uh, and because it, the sapphire is brittle at the end, right? So we put a liner inside there, like a little quartz tube that uh, protects from that kind of thing. So we've grown hundreds of growths using some volatile material. We've never had any sign of contamination on the, on the, on the quartz. Uh, you have to have some kind of control software that you can monitor the process, and here's the this is the fun part. It's not all done by a touch screen. You actually get to turn knobs on like that. Um, and then you can watch everything on the screen. So it's all, it's a, it's a nice uh, uh, kind of system. Okay. So that's the, the fr fr pressure furnace. Now I'm going to go through a few examples of actual case studies from our lab of, you know, what we did with this furnace to justify uh, buying it and using it. Yeah, sure. Pressure, uh, I don't remember, is it generated, is it just from the bottom pressure? So from uh, in our furnace, because 150 bar, we can just generate from a pop, right? 300 bar is, I don't think you can, I can't find a cylinder of So what Tyrell has, he has an intensifier. So he has a basically an oxygen pressure intensifier. Pressure. It is, it, it's a pump, essentially, a compressor in his lab. Have you ever been down there to visit it? Uh, yeah. yeah, you should go down there. So you, you, they've got the whole thing in a special room. It's a, it's a nice operation. He's got there. Okay, so actually, I lied. This one's not from my lab. This is from, uh, from Dresden. And so this is this example of changing sort of something from a congruently melting compound to a, uh, sorry, incongruently melting compound to a congruently melting compound. And congruently melting compounds are much easier to grow. So here's a phase diagram. It's a calculated phase diagram using this sort of compad so software. Um, and they were interested in looking at this spin ladder compound. Um, and what you see here, now that you're experts at looking at phase diagrams, is that this compound here uh, melts incongruently. Right? So there's a, a, a paratactic here uh, where you have a, 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 an equilibrium between some uh, uh, cobalt oxide and a liquid that's rich in copper. But the, but the material itself does not uh, uh, melt. Now you could grow this, but it would be a challenge um, because if you have a really narrow window here, it's pretty small, right? It's maybe 30 or 40 degrees Celsius. So that's tough to grow. Might be able to find a good flux, you know, a, a good uh, uh, self flux to grow, but it's pretty tough, narrow. So what better if you could just make this a congruently melting compound? And it turns out that uh, using these calculations, they showed that in uh, uh, sort of, I, think, I don't remember, is it labeled on here? It isn't labeled on here, but maybe this is 50 or 100 bar or something, that the phase diagram changes completely. And so now you can see that the compound melts uh, congruently into a liquid, and so much better situation. So 
Here's an example of their growth using their high pressure furnace, which was like mark one of this. And if they do it at one bar, it's just an awful mess of copper oxide, cobalt oxide, maybe the phase is in there someplace, but it's really pretty garbagey. Here they went to 60 bar, and now the vast majority of this is this copper, cobalt copper 203. There's some little inclusions of some things. There's some problems here. Uh, so it's not perfect, but it's made, it, it, my guess is if they really worked and optimized this, they'd be able to grow a, a really good crystal. Maybe they did. Um, there's one other problem with this phase diagram. Anybody see it? What another challenge to grow this material is? No takers? Okay. There's a lower limit of stability for the phase, right? So um, below 927 degrees C, it decomposes, right? And so it's possible that these little inclusions here actually represent that during the cooling process, you're actually, you know, phase separating the system. So that's a that's another challenge where maybe you've got to somehow grow it quickly, you've got to quench it, you've got to do something to uh, get a more, at more post annealing in some way and, and then quench it. So that's a, I mean, that's just, uh, that's what nature gives you. Okay, um, the next uh, topic is new phase discovery. Uh, so maybe that's really um, generous. But anyway, <laughs> uh, here's a material, this calcium 3 cobalt 206 It's actually it's a known compound, and uh, it's an interesting material that's uh, it's made up of chains where cobalt uh, 3 sits in either a, an octahedron or a trigonal prism alternatively along these chains. There's a large family of materials like this. Uh, but uh, they stack uh, along the C-axis. If you look down, you see a, a triangular lattice pattern. And so what's, what's, what's fascinating from the physics of these, each of these chains is like an icing magnet. So it's like a, all the spins point up, or they all, or they all spin, point spin down. And, uh, and so you have for natural frustration of this on a triangular lattice. And that gives rise to neat things like these magnetic steps, um, possibly quantum tunneling. And, uh, and some strange behavior in uh, dynamic behavior, non-equilibrium spin states uh, measured by neutron diffraction, where if you, you cool this stuff down uh, into an antiferromagnetic phase, and if, if initially you just get an uh, incommensurate phase, but then over time, some sort of commensurate phase develops out of that. So uh, this would be neat to study, um, but only small crystals have been grown from flux, like little needles. So we set out to say, maybe we can grow this using our high pressure furnace because we're stabilizing cobalt-3. Um, so here's a phase diagram, and it's a cheater phase diagram. It's a pseudo-binary because it's got cobalt oxide, not, 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 not CO, not cobalt-3. Um, but what you see, here's a target material, and uh, it has an upper level, level of stability. It's not even that it's uh, uh, paratechnically melting. It decomposes uh, into um, rock salt uh, solid solutions but long before you reach a liquid. I call this a landlocked compound, uh, and, and what we'd like to do is somehow find a route to the sea. Right? We've got to find a way to get a liquid in contact with this uh, solid if we're going to grow crystals. Uh, and so uh, this fellow here that did this calculation, I wrote him and said, can you do this calculation of pressure? And he said, well, if I put 100 bar of oxygen, then all of a sudden I've increased this uh, decomposition point to where now we actually have a paratactic. Now it's pretty close to the liquid. It's 100 bar, it's not very far from 150. It's some calculation with who knows, knows what parameters are in there. And this, this, the shift in temperature of this line with pressure is, is logarithmic. <laughs> so um, it, it's kind of dicey whether it's going to work or not, but it gave us enough impetus to try it. Right? So we tried it and failed. Okay? We did not make that material. Um, we discovered a new material. Right? So we discovered uh, calcium-2 cobalt-205, which is a brown millerite. It's a deep order defect structure of a perovskite. Um, I won't go into the details of this other than say it's, it's a unique material. There's only maybe one or two other like it, where these tetrahedra, they're normally disordered massively in the structure, but these are all ordered in all three dimensions. And so that's a really rare find for this. Nobody ever made this material before, despite trying it. Nobody ever made it, but we made it. There's some very strange sort of uh, uh, reentric phase transitions that occur in this. It's got some interesting magnetism. There's multiple antiferromagnetic structures that we've never been able to solve. And so we discovered a completely new material by a little bit of you know, serendipity in this case. It also says why you know, these guys got the phase diagram wrong, because they didn't know this phase existed. Maybe if they knew about it, then they could uh, recalculate. 
Okay, so that's um, sort of discovering new materials. Now I want to talk about uh, sort of physics-driven ex uh, experiments um, in no materials. So probably most of you, have, at one point or other, have now, so probably most of you were, weren't born when this phase diagram was, right? This is now uh, 1986, so we're talking, you know, 32 years ago, right? So this phase diagram predates you. Well, this is not particular, but the discovery of high PC superconductivity. But in those days, people were looking for analogs, and they started looking at nickel rather than copper. So nickel is just, you know, kind of next door. And, and they never found superconductivity. In fact, what was always found was these uh, uh, insulators that had uh, so-called stripes in them. And, and, and the stripe phases, so this is the material that everybody studied. It's a single layer, so-called single layer Wilson copper phase. It's a layered perovskite. Um, and, and here you're seeing the uh, resistivity as a function of temperature, and they, they form these sort of, sort of semiconductor or uh, semiconductor to uh, insulator uh, transitions, and uh, using neutron diffraction, John Trinquata and others, Sang Chong showed that that's due to uh, a real space ordering of charge and spins into these uh, into these stripes. Okay, and and so this is a competing ground state with superconductivity. So they never got superconductivity. Uh, so we asked ourselves the question, um, what happens if you, could in, if you could sort of increase the dimensionality? So this is sort of a 2D material. What if you could sort of make this more three-dimensional like by stacking more octahedra together? And, uh, and so there's this Rumsden this Rumsden popper series. You go from one to two to three. Uh, and, order, and in the limit of uh, infinity, you get a cross to have it. Um, and so this wasn't sort of crazy because the, uh, if you look at things like manganites and so forth, these strike phases, are, uh, you find them in single layer materials, but you don't find them when you go to n equals 2 or, or n equals 3. So we said, well, maybe in the nickelates, the same things uh, kind of will happen. But um, nobody ever grown crystals of these materials. And here's why. Here's a phase diagram. There's a lot of stuff on here. Um, so let me just kind of decorate it. So here's the n equals 1 material that people grew and did the, the, the tranquata looked at the crystals. And they were float zone crystals. This material is, uh, is stable to very high temperature. It melts paratechnically, but you can grow the crystals. Um, here's the two-layer material, however, and now you see, just like in the cobalt oxide I showed you a minute ago, calcium cobalt oxide, this stuff decomposes. So does the, the three-layer material, and so forth and so on, um, and so does the perovskite. So all these materials, they're also landlocked, no liquid in sight. So what happens? Uh, well. Obviously, I wouldn't be talking about them if we couldn't grow crystals. Right? So we put them in the high pressure furnace. We started out wanting to grow this material, this lanthanum nickel of three. Um, we could talk about you know why. We grew, managed to grow a crystal of this. But in the process, we started to see some of these Wollaston popper phases appearing too. So we optimized our growth conditions under high pressure to get those materials and grow crystals of them. So you can see they cleave nicely so you can do ARPAs and other stuff. Um, so here's a, a schematic. Diagram, how am I doing, by the way? 10 minutes or something? Yeah, five minutes. OK, I'll go quick. Um, uh, and, and what you find is that uh, in the case of lanthanum, this 2 and 4 material is stable at 1 bar. That's why everybody can grow it. Uh, but then you go to 2 layer, 3 layer, and perovskite with increasing pressure. And uh, you know, gratifyingly, uh, the, uh, the average oxidation state of the nickel increases as you go up in pressure, it makes, it makes perfect sense. So we found this sweet spot where we could grow the 4310 and the 327 and the 113. If you go to praseodymium, it's a lot more difficult. This 214 is much more stable to high pressure. Uh, we never found the 327. And uh, uh, 4310 is only sort of our limit of what we can do. And we started to sort of see hits of 113. We'll come back to that. But we, never, we weren't under our furnace to be able to make that as a single phase. Uh, but we, we were able to grow this uh, 4310 material, this three layer material that was the easiest one to grow uh, in, in a clean form. And we studied it. You can't see anything on here, but I'm uh, going to blow it up. So this is a diffraction pattern at uh, 160 Kelvin and 130. And uh, what you see here at 160 is just a bright spot associated with an average lattice. If you cool it down, you start to see uh, some satellites, which you can see here more a little bit better. Um, there's one blown up to show it's really there. And uh, it turns out that these uh, correspond uh, uh, to the appearance of a phase transition. It's a metal-to-metal -metal phase transition in these materials. 
Uh, and so unlike the charge strike phases in the uh, single layer material, this seems to be more like maybe a Fermi surface driven effect because it's a, uh, we would expect it to be at one third, one third uh, based on the electron count, but it isn't, it's some very different uh, uh, cube. Uh, finishing up on this, in the case of these nicolates, uh, so these are interesting materials because of this phase diagram that's been around for a long time. And what's interesting is the question is what's the nature of this insulator to metal transition in the underlying anti-ferromagnetic ground state? There's a lot of questions about this, but no crystals. People look at films. So we started to grow some of these, as I've shown you, we've already grown the lanthanum. I mean, the interesting materials are up here, and we've never really succeeded in doing it, and now you're going to see why. Um, here's lanthanum nicolate, we grew that. Um, here's praseidinium nicolate. We couldn't grow it in our furnace, so we went to Tyrell's system. Right, so it's a user facility, this paradigm user facility. I'm sure he, I'm sure he advertised that when he was here. And, and we went down there, and we're still not happy with the crystals, but we're getting there. Uh, but here we can now see this metal insulator transition in praseidymium. It behaves as expected on the, on the, uh, from what you know from polycrystal materials. And so now we're starting to grow. Look, it's 290 bar. We're at the limit of his furnace. So if you think about trying to move to these smaller rare earths, we're really not going to be able to do it with the kind of technology today, unfortunately. Okay, the final example I want to give is uh, on extending uh, phase boundaries or doping ranges. So I talked about uh, the manganites, and here's, so this is something right in my early days of my career I worked on a lot. These uh, bilayer manganite materials, colossal magnetic resistive materials, and we, we using, using polycrystalline samples that we just figured out how to make, we were able to essentially span this phase diagram of uh, doping strontium in for lanthanum into this, into this material. And don't worry about all the lines and curves and, and domes. There's a lot going on here. Just I want you to focus on this particular spot right here, where we go with no long range order. So despite the fact that on either side of this little valley of death, we find antiferromagnets, um, in this particular region, there was no long range magnetic order determined by neutron diffraction, right? So that doesn't mean there's no magnetic order. It just means it's not long range and static. And that just never made sense to me. I, it, it, I couldn't understand it. Uh, and so we, now we, we, but we couldn't grow crystals in our floating zone furnace. But then we said, look, we're, as we go this direction, we're putting more manganese 4 in here. So we're trying to oxidize this manganese from 3 to 4. Maybe using high pressure, we can stabilize uh, deeper into this phase diagram. And, and so we did, and we grew these crystals. They're not so great looking, uh, but we were able to clean out pieces. And uh, here's a diffraction pattern, so we made the phase, and we were able to study it. And what we found here is that above room temperature, there's a feature. And it's some kind of uh, uh, magnetic transition, obviously. And uh, when we went and uh, did some x-ray diffraction, uh, sure enough, uh, even at room temperature, you see these little extra spots that look like a little square surrounding the central dot, which is the, the average pit. And so, um, uh, there's some sort of charge order that's occurring in this material, some sort of real space ordering of charge. It turns out there's also a spin ordering transition, a, a magnetic transition, so you wouldn't guess it looking at this, at this curve. Uh, and if you, and we use neutrons to explore that. And what we found is that the propagation vector for the, uh, the, uh, the spin and the charge order are in this two to one ratio, this magic two to one ratio that's uh, found for spin strikes. And so there's some sort of long wavelength strike, I think, that's forming in this material that we couldn't see before. And the reason we never saw long range order using neutron diffraction of powders is that the intensity of these little spots is five or six orders of magnitude below what we see uh, uh, below the Bragg spots, the main Bragg spots. And so we're, there's no way we're ever going to find it with powders. So it's a weak, weak sort of perturbation to the underlying matter. Okay. So that's sort of my, my story on high pressure uh, zone uh, uh, furnace work. Again, it's a tool, it's a hammer, but I hope to show you that everything isn't necessarily a nail, that we're really trying to think about physics problems that we can solve using this technique, uh, either discovering materials, growing ungrowable stuff like the nicolates, um, or extending uh, doping regimes, and uh, the suppressive and volatilization. Well, maybe, maybe not. I think that's a case-by-case basis. Uh, if we look to the future, uh, well, maybe we want to go to higher pressures somehow. Um, 
300 bar uh, is available now down the street from you. You can write a new proposal. Uh, what if we wanted to say something like Google or kill a bar? Well, maybe we could use those lasers to do something like that. Uh, for sure, it would be nice if we had some better phase diagram calculations. And we simply need to learn more about what's going on in these supercritical fluids if we want to really understand how to tailor the synthesis of new materials. So with that, thank you very much.